There are over 13,000 cards for duelists to create the perfect deck. Many of those cards made their very first appearance in the anime, but for some they would never cross the bridge to the physical card game. Have these cards been lost to time, or are they far too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? The time has come to answer these questions once and for all. Duel Monsters is over. Welcome to the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Aster Phoenix, the anti-hero and the sharpest dresser in all of GX. Seriously, that silver suit is kind of on point. But aside from being the prettiest belle at the ball, Aster's introduction in Season 2 was a pivotal change to the show in the right direction. Along with the likes of Zane Truesdale, him defeating Jaden Yuki helped to recontextualize that Jaden was not the stereotypical OP main character that could never be defeated because he had a premium subscription to Plot Armors R Us. Granted, it was that way for the remaining 96% of the series, but it's among my favorite duels in GX, and I view it in a similar vein to Raphael defeating Atem in Waking the Dragons. Going into Aster's anime-exclusive cards is a peculiar task. His anime cards fittingly revolve around his signature Destiny hero cards, most of which we have seen in the physical game. But several of them work under a completely different context because those real-world cards have very different effects in the show, and we'll address those examples when they arise. Without further ado, it's time to take the D. No, not like that. We're starting with his D series of hero support cards. D Acceleration is a quick play spell card which can only be activated during your battle phase. Target one destiny hero monster you control that is equipped with one or more equip cards. Destroy all equip cards equipped to that monster and have that monster's attack. That monster can attack twice during this turn's battle phase. Gonna need you to pump the brakes on that one, Aster. Destiny heroes have very few in-theme methods of equipping cards, but for those that they do have, not including Plasma, they're not very good. So, playing Deacceleration now forces you to fill your deck with some of the worst tools that they have at their disposal. And unfortunately, that trade-off more or less puts you in an even worse predicament than you were in before. I can't even charitably say which hero would be the best to use with this because there are only two that even remotely benefit from getting to attack twice. Dominance lets you draw a card when it destroys a monster in battle, so in theory you could draw two cards, but it's a hard once per turn effect, meaning it could attack five times and you're still only going to draw one card. Dystopia has what is likely the most relevant of effects being able to readjust its attack back to its original after being halved, meaning you get two shots with 2800 points because we're playing Destiny Hero Beatdown in 2024 I guess, and it's not as though what few equipable cards Destiny Heroes have access to get any kind of floating effect for being destroyed so we're not netting any advantage from clearing our back row either. It's just way too much setup for a whole lot of nothing because in most cases you would find yourself in the position to use this in combination with one of the lower level heroes who already have abysmal attack values to begin with. Hopefully this wasn't wasted on a double dude. So, Aster has officially come out the gate tripping over his shoelaces. I've fallen and I can't get up! But I'm hopeful that his next card is able to boost him up. D-Boost is a normal trap card that can only be activated while D-Force is face up on top of your deck. Draw two cards from underneath D-Force. I'd imagine that you are just as confused as I was upon reading this for the first time, and for good reason. The D-Force that we have in the physical game at no time would ever be face up on top of your deck. But D-Boost works on the basis of D-Force's original anime card effect, which places itself on top of the deck and prevents the owner from drawing during their draw phase. For once, we got the better end of the deal. So, it's now a question of how boost could be altered to still work in tandem with what we have in force. I could maybe see this becoming a simple draw too if you control a face-up D-Force. That being said, either version is not fantastic. Cards like Reckless Greed have fallen out of favor due to being incapable of keeping up with the modern meta, and while D-Boost is an improvement on that effect, it's still a trap card pretending to be a draw spell that has now passed its time of potential relevance. If this were more similar to a card like, say, Destiny Draw, then I could have said with certainty that D-Boost would have been a Destiny Hero staple, but as it is, is, it serves only as a relic of the meta that we once knew. D-Burst ow, is a normal spell card that targets one equipped equip card you control, destroy it, then draw one card. 
During your battle phase, you can banish this card from your graveyard to target one face-up monster you control. It loses 1,000 attack and can attack twice during this battle phase. Sounds awfully familiar. It's almost like we just looked at this card, because this is damn near identical to D Acceleration, with the most insignificant alterations to the effect. That being said, the additions of a draw 1 effect and not being exclusive to Destiny Heroes makes this card infinitely better. In a Destiny Hero deck, Dystopia remains an objectively better choice to use the effect on, granting 2 attacks at full power. We can explore some of the generic options, and I'm inclined to think that Infer Noble Knights could possibly do something with this because they love their equip cards. Other than that, I mean, what are you gonna do, tech this into Fiendsmiths? I know it would technically work, but please don't. You would need to be very sick in the mind to attempt that, much like using the next card. D-Mind, which I kinda would've liked for it to be named Mind D with a capital D, but I guess that doesn't really fit the naming convention for the rest of the archetype. It's a normal spell card that can be activated while you control no face-up Destiny Hero monsters. Special summon one level 3 or lower Destiny Hero monster from your deck. Was someone asking for Destiny Heroes to be the greatest tech choice of all time? Where do I even start with this one? It's a hero lives on steroids. Not requiring your field to be empty offers a lot more versatility in either extending your plays or being a nice starter card for really any deck. No life point cost is also nice, although its elemental hero counterpart has proven that the cost never mattered in the slightest. It's a non-once per turn effect, which is ridiculous, meaning at the bare minimum you can turn each destiny hero summoned into a link 1 to make the next copy live. I'd say the worst aspect of this card is that there isn't necessarily a good level 3 or lower destiny hero monster to summon with this card. Since we're linking them away, it doesn't really matter though, but our best targets would be a combination of dark angel or Dreamer, Doomlord, and Denier. That concludes Aster's D series of support cards, and we definitely ended on a high note. His remaining anime exclusives have a tough act to follow, but I don't feel that it will be too much of a challenge because the next series of cards centers around one of Aster's ace monsters, the Unstoppable Destiny Hero Plasma! And I should also note that some of these cards were originally played by another character before they became a part of Aster's deck. Starting with Drain Time, a normal spell card that requires you to control a face-up Destiny Hero Plasma to activate. You choose one of these six turn phases, those being Draw, Standby, Main 1, Battle, Main 2, or End Phase. And then both players are forced to skip their next occurrence of the selected phase. Saying that I'm divided on this card would be an understatement. Throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history, we've seen several cards that skip turn phases, but more often than not, it only applies to one player. Time Seal skips the draw phase, Solomon's Law Book skips the standby phase, Dugary's The Timeless can skip the draw phase, main phase, or the battle phase, Terminal World skips both players' main phase too, and there isn't really an example of skipping the end phase, truthfully I'm not even sure how that would work in-game. Something that all of these cards share is that they're pretty bad, except for maybe Dugary's. And I am almost certain that this card would follow the same trend. Most competitive decks don't live or die by the draw phase. The standby phase is just that weird limbo state where sometimes things happen, but it being skipped usually doesn't affect the game state. Main phase 1 could be a bit more detrimental seeing as that's the bread and butter of a turn, but we also have main phase 2 to accomplish what is needed to be done. I mean, evenly matched has players willingly giving up their main phase 1 to take care of their opponent's board, so we're clearly not against making sacrifices. Sacrifices. Everything after that is meaningless. A battle phase getting skipped might buy you an extra turn so you can lose later in the round. Main phase 2 is irrelevant, and I'm still racking my brain on what happens if an end phase gets skipped. Maybe we just keep this one in the anime. Force of 4 is a continuous spell card, and upon activation, if either player has more than 4 cards in their hand, they must send cards to the graveyard until there are 4 cards in their hand. While either player has 4 or fewer cards in their hand, if an effect would add new cards from their deck or graveyard to their hand that would cause their hand size to exceed 4, they must send all of those cards to the graveyard instead. Two things were made abundantly clear with this card. One, Aster hates Exodia decks. Two, if not for Destiny Heroes, Aster was meant to play Dark Worlds or Light Swarns. And that is dependent on how the second effect resolves. If the cards that would be added are instead milled due to exceeding the hand size limit, then Light Swarns now have an obscenely powerful new consistency option that allows them to pick exactly what cards are milled. But if the cards that would be added do in fact reach the hand first and then get discarded, which would be by effect, 
I mean, we all know how Dark Worlds feel about free discards. Can you think of any other deck that would abuse the shit out of purposefully discarding every card that they can search? Considering that there were four Dark World monsters acting as duelists during Season 3, I'm actually shocked that none of them played this card. On the flip side, I don't see that this card would be of any real threat to modern decks because everyone and their mother has a way to recover cards in Grave. But for the decks that don't have in-house recovery, so every deck that I play, this hurts. A lot. Typically, cards that alter the hand size limit are inconceivably bad, unless you're paired with the one goofball running slaver at your locals. I'd wager that you can still count the times that situation has arisen on one hand, though. This, on the other hand, takes the spirit of what I think the hand size limiting cards were trying to do, then amplified and perfected it leaving us with a very interesting form of modern hand control. Just don't get too carried away or you might have to enter a pact with your opponent. A greed pact to be precise. It's a normal trap card, which, side note, seeing the original pot of greed artwork on a trap card feels like it should be illegal. But this card allows both players to draw one card. It's fine, nothing really special or inspiring here. One day of peace, but we've toned down the degeneracy like a little bit. Now wait a second, what happened to Destiny Hero Plasma? He's only been mentioned in one card so far. Okay, you got me. I just needed to find a place to fit these cards in, but now I promise we're strictly on Plasma support. Plasma Counter is a normal trap card that can be activated only during the damage step when a face-up Destiny Hero Plasma you control is attacked by an opponent's monster, and D-Force is face-up on top of your deck. The attacking monster's attack is halved, and Destiny Hero Plasma gains 1500 attack. In the anime, this card needing D-Force to be face-up on your deck only works against its fairly decent effect. In the real world, on the other hand, this is a huge boost. D-Force already protects your plasma, as well as giving what can become a substantial attack boost, so tacking on another 1500 points, plus having the opponent's monsters attack, could lead them into losing the duel of their own doing. Finally, a trap card has reclaimed its meaning. Knowing what's to come, this is without question my favorite of Aster's Plasma support cards. Next is Plasma Discharger, and Plasma being in the name is all the relation it has to our destiny hero. Bruh. A normal trap card that you can activate during your opponent's battle phase by destroying one equipped equip card you control, end the battle phase. Hmm, seems like this will become a theme for GX, having at least one battle trap per episode that I have to compare to the better options that we already have in the physical game, who can all produce the same results, but far more efficiently. And in the same fashion as Deacceleration and D-Burst, we are now made to run in-theme equipable cards so this card isn't completely dead, in turn making it even worse than it was. I'm not crazy, right? Would you run Negate Attack or Threatening Roar over this? You better. And Aster's final anime exclusive card is Plasma Roar, a continuous trap card whose effect can only be activated during your opponent's standby phase if you control Destiny Hero Plasma. You can then place one Plasma Counter on this card. While this card has two or more Plasma Counters on it, you can send this face-up card to the graveyard to destroy one monster on the field and inflict damage to your opponent equal to half the attack of that monster. Well, they had the right idea, but made some missteps along the way. This is far too slow to ever work. In an early GX format, or even up to Edison format, this card might have seen success, as you could reliably survive two of your opponent's turns, and back row destruction probably wouldn't get wasted on this. Any format after, I'd say you could get the first counter on with relatively low pushback, but that's about as easy as it's going to get. If plasma counters occurred anywhere else in the game, there may have also been other uses for that one counter that can be accrued. That's not the case though, and this card would introduce the counters to the game. I I've always wondered why there are so many cards between the anime and physical game that are the exclusive holder of certain counters. For a character whose belief system was so strongly tied to destiny and the structure of predetermined results, it's extremely odd that Aster has quite a mixed bag of cards, many of which have an overall chance of not even working. Frankly, the script seems to be doing a lot of heavy lifting for his wins, but maybe there's more to it. What molded Aster Phoenix into the duelist we see in the pro leagues? Kyle Jables, better known as The D, was a duelist in the Pro League of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX and became the legal guardian to Aster Phoenix after kidnapping Aster's father. Let's just say that that nap was of the permanent variety. Pending investigations aside, The D had three exclusive cards to the anime contained in his deck centered around Destiny Hero Plasma. 
The first of which is Enigma the Creator, a level 4 dark warrior effect monster with 1200 attack and defense. And this monster carries a standard battle floating effect. When this card is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, special summon one Enigma token which exactly matches the stats and characteristics of Enigma. Boy, this card would have been great in 2007. Like its battle tutor predecessors, floating into another level 4 is perfectly serviceable. Floating into a token, however, is noticeably worse. You would almost always want an actual monster, one that can also perform a task, unless your extra deck options require non-effect materials. I can't say that it's bad, but well outdated, even for mid-GX time. Next up is Claret Note, a normal spell card that can only be activated if your opponent controls one or more monsters. You then get to special summon Plasma Tokens. Level 1 Dark Warriors with zero attack and defense for every four levels on your opponent's side of the field. My initial thought on this card is that it's a fantastic going second card, be it a starter or otherwise. Then crickets, because where else would this card really be successful? This could either be a huge blowout in field advantage, or you will never get a single token from this. Being strictly tied to levels only means if your opponent's board is black and blue, you can at least imagine how nice it would have been to be able to summon based on the total link ratings and or ranks while your opponent points and laughs. Luck might favor you though, and your opponent has a synchro or two on board, but with meta dominating decks, you'll get three tokens at most based on their combined levels. What are you using them for? I, I don't know, Cross Crusader, do people still play that? Three tokens is certainly not a bad payoff, but it's also the five-ish percent chance in any given match. I do still like it, it just has the majority of the extra deck working against it. Anyways, we've now reached the D's last card, and it's, uh... Certainly an anime card, if that says anything. Unfair Judge is a normal spell card that can only be activated at the end of a battle phase in which the attack of a face-up monster you control was negated. I'm gonna stop you right there, buddy, because that's not how that works. This would need to be a quick play in the physical game to even be playable unless we want another counter-counter situation, uh, but go on. Pay 800 life points, then target one monster you control. If the total attack of all face-up attack position monsters your opponent controls and the total defense of all face-up defense position monsters your opponent controls are both greater than the targeted monster's attack, you can conduct a second battle phase this turn. During that battle phase, the targeted monster can attack all monsters your opponent controls once each, and only the targeted monster can attack during that second battle phase. I warned you, this is the animeist of anime card effects. That being said, it's not even kind of good. Thankfully, if your opponent only controls monsters in one position, the opposing position is not considered for this effect to be able to resolve. It's bad, but it could have been levels of unplayable only matched by gather your mind. Be that as it may, there isn't much to capitalize on here. Regardless of which monster's attack was negated and which monster you choose to launch your second battle phase, unless you're playing a super aggressive monster with massive attack power, the monster you choose will more than likely not be able to run over all of your opponent's monsters. If anything, that second battle phase will simply be a redo of a single attack. And we've wasted a lot of time and resources to do what other cards can do with no cost or requirements and just do the thing. So, it's easy to be worked around without your opponent even intentionally doing so. Godspeed, but you can keep this one. We were destined to make it to the end, and we finally made it. You know what that means. It's time for the patent pending Purple Pineapple Grading Scale. I'll take the total number of cards covered in this week's episode and get a percentage based on the number of cards that I feel deserve to be imported to the physical game. Anything 70% or above is a passing grade. Of the 13 cards that we've covered this week, Aster and the D get a 54% with 7 cards that I think are worthy of cutting down some trees for. Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. If you're new to the channel here, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me down below with bell notifications on so you never miss a single episode of this series. If you missed last week's episode, you can check that out in the bottom right corner. Or if you want to check out Season 1 where we covered every anime exclusive card from the Duel Monsters era, you can check out the playlist right up here. Thanks again for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next one.